thank you, Ayman, um, and good morning. It's, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, when, when I was invited to give this lecture, uh, the first task they gave me was to choose a topic, and they left it wide open. So I thought back on, on Dr. Paffenbarger and my interactions with him, and I wanted to come up with a topic that was, that was very relevant to what we're talking about today in public health, and one that I could use many of his examples from research um, when I try to explain some of the concepts in this tutorial lecture. And the, the kind of the third thing was, you know, it is a tutorial lecture. I kind of wanted to leave with a message uh, around the independence of physical activity. This was something that was very important to uh, PATH, and I talked to, to him on many occasions about the independence of physical activity. And as I move along, I'll try to use examples from his studies as well as my own when we think about the independence of physical activity. And I also need to thank um, uh, both I'm in and Steve. I understand that they nominated me for this lecture, so I thank them very, very much for that, as well as the program committee for allowing me to speak today. Uh, to get to business, uh, I just put up my disclosures briefly. Uh, to say that over the past 10 years, I've had funding from both government, foundation, and industry sponsorship for my studies. These were all directed to my institution. And I've also done a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of consulting for government and non-government agencies as well. So those are my disclosures. Um, talking a little bit about PATH, most of us are familiar with him. I, I, I don't think you could read a textbook on exercise physiology or physical activity epidemiology without learning about Dr. Paffenberger. Um, he was an MD. He had a very strong focus on public health. He had over 200 publications, and last count I checked the other day, it was over 30,000 citations of this work. And when you consider the era in which he was publishing, most of his work, his major work, was pre-electronic. This is a pre-electronic era. So this is an outstanding uh, career. Uh, he's been a great mentor to many of us. I put up there just two studies, the College Alumni Study and the San Francisco Longshoreman. These were very, very uh, seminal works, although we also understand that he was involved with many studies, including the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. He worked with Dr. Steve Blair on many publications and also with I Min Lee on many other cohorts. So he's had a tremendous impact on the field, and it's uh, really an honor today to talk about some of his work. I first met him in 2000 at the Hockley Valley Conference in Ontario. It was a conference on the dose response issues of physical activity and health. And this is where I first started talking to Dr. Paffenberger about the independence of physical activity. And he would always say, you know, the dose response is, is definitely something we need to consider, but we have to also understand whether physical activity is an independent risk factor for chronic disease or premature mortality. And that's kind of what my focus is today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm calling back to the future, just to look at physical activity and health, then move right on to independence, main topic. And I think in any lecture today, when you're considering the independence of physical activity, we also need to talk about sedentary behavior and whether it is independent of physical activity. Finally, I'll close with what I think are some key research directions for the field. So I start with this. This is one of the things I remember most about all of the publications of Dr. Paffenbarger. This was his New England Journal of Medicine paper of the Harvard Alumni Study of 17,000 Harvard alumni men followed for 12 to 16 years. That is a nice dose response curve showing you know, higher levels of physical activity are associated with lower risk of mortality. And you know, he used to talk about 2,000 kilocalories per week, sometimes 1,500 kilocalories per week being a, somewhat of a threshold. And we see that that, that that sort of approximates the current guidelines. It's a little bit higher. But around 1,500 kilocalories per week, when you go above that, you know, the, the risk continues to decline, and it never does increase beyond that point. So people always talk about this uptick in risk at the end. It never does increase beyond where you would be with the current physical activity recommendations. 
So you know, higher levels of activity are not really hazardous to us. They're still lower than the uh, being not active at all. So that's about 36 or 37 years ago by my count. And he would talk about energy expenditure of walking, climbing stairs, playing sports, yard work, and so forth. So fast forward to 2015, now we have a much larger study of over 600,000 adults from several cohorts pooled here. This was just published a month or so ago in JAMA Internal Medicine. And just look at the shape of that curve. You know, it is very similar. It, it's replicating the results from 30 some odd years ago. What's changed, you know, the, the scale has changed. We're now looking at met hours per week of physical activity and multiples of the recommended leisure time physical activity level. And we see here that at one time the level, seven and a half med hours per week, which are the minimum current guidelines, and above, we see the exact same thing, that the risk never does get higher than that level. So even at very, very high levels of physical activity, the risk remains lower than being physically inactive. And that's what I'm calling back to the future, because if you see these two slides, you'll see that going from about 17,000 men to a huge cohort of over half a million people in 2015, we're, we're uncovering that same relationship with mortality. This shows very good consistency in the association between activity and mortality over time. It's uncanny how close these look. There's another paper in 2014, another huge pooled analysis that you could overlay on this as well. So I men mentioned the Lancet Physical Activity Series and for me, this was just an amazing group to be involved with, an amazing writing group. We had a lot of fun with it. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun because we're hoping that it has a public health impact. And we know, certainly, physical activity is associated with a, a variety of outcomes, both uh, comorbidities or morbidities, as well as things such as increases in fitness and muscular fitness. So I'm not going to get into that here. We, we all know this. We take it for granted. But you know, from a public health standpoint, in terms of impact, you know, to be able to show, using a very rigorous methodology and being very conservative, that 9% of premature mortality globally is attributable to physical inactivity, and that 6 to 10% of the major chronic diseases are directly attributable to physical inactivity across the world. So for me, this was very, very exciting. And now it sets the stage to talk about more about you know, the independence of physical activity. Sure, it's definitely a, a chronic disease risk factor, but is it independence? Or is it independent? So you know, there's many definitions of independence. Um, it means different things to different people. For the colonies of the United States, <laughs> in uh, July 4, 1776, they called out the king of Great Britain, calling him a tyrant several times, and declaring their independence from Great Britain. This was very concrete. The United States is an independent nation. Then you fast forward to now, and this is my 16-year-old daughter, and she's 16 going on 25, so she considers herself very independent, except when she needs something. <laughs> so for me, that's a different level of independence. And I call that relative independence versus absolute independence on the left. But this is what we're talking about. Now, from a statistical point of view, an independent risk factor can be considered a, a risk factor that remains a significant predictor of an outcome in a model that contains other covariates. So you're saying once you adjust for age and sex and ethnicity, we have an independent effect of this risk factor. And what, what it means is, from a uh, strictly uh, conceptual point of view, statistically, that it is a statistical concept, it depends on the set of variables in the model. So different studies with different models and different covariates may show an independent effect or not an independent effect, depending on how many covariates they have. And the other thing we have to realize, it does not imply causality. It's just a statistical concept, independence. However, um, in thinking about this over the years, in my opinion, I think if a risk factor shows independent effects statistically in a series of hierarchical models of increasing complexity in different uh, covariates and in different subgroups of the population, 
men, women, African Americans, Caucasians, in the presence or absence of other risk factors, so it shows an independent effect among smokers and non-smokers, those with hypertension, those without, and across multiple populations and across multiple studies in terms of being replica, rec replicable. If, if this all holds up, I think we can really talk, begin to talk about the independence of a risk factor per se. Not just the statistical concept, but we have an independent risk factor. And in my opinion, it can be reasonably established, and this evidence can then now feed into the causal framework, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this is what we're trying to get at, is physical activity independent of other risk factors. And so, if the evidence does support this assertion, that physical activity is an independent risk factor, I think as a profession, we need to do a better job uh, of dissemination, both in the scientific and in the lay literature of this. You know, if you, if you look at the media, and every week there's, there are more and more reports out there about physical activity and the lack of effects here and there, and you'll see in a moment some of the major organizations still not really taking physical activity seriously, that we still have more work to do if indeed it's an independent risk factor. So just doing a very quick you know, uh, PubMed search on independence or independent risk factors and physical activity or exercise, we see over time there's an increase. Like most, uh, most topics, there's a lot more papers being published every year on a given topic. But now we have about 700 papers per year being published with the keywords of independence and physical activity. So it's a very, very topical um, research area right now. So when you think about causal inference then, you know, we need to establish this, this causal framework. Does physical inactivity cause disease? Well, you know, Robert uh, Koch, um, he was a microbiologist and he established a, the Koch's um, postulates around the um, Microbi microorganisms causing disease. So there are four of those that needed to be met to show causation. Then of course we move on to Bradford, Bradford Hill. We have the Bradford Hill criteria. And look who's on the list, on my list anyway, is Ralph Paffenbarger with respect to physical activity. He took this the next step in physical activity research. And you know, some of you may remember I was just getting out of high school, but this was 1988 when he published the Wolf Memorial Lecture here at the American College of Sports Medicine. And in that lecture, he established you know, these epidemiological principles to establish a cause and effect relationship between physical inactivity and coronary heart disease. And you'll see here the 10 principles. They follow very closely the Bradford Hill um, criteria, but one of importance that really stands out is independence. And he really felt strongly that independence of a risk factor was part of the cause and effect criteria. And in that paper, he showed evidence from, uh, from some of his prior publications of the Harvard alumni study. And these are, I'm sure you've seen these types of figures before. They're kind of a 3D representation. So whether or not people smoke or the amount of smoking they do per day, increasing um, decreasing levels of activity result in higher rates of mortality. So it doesn't matter whether or not you smoke. Here, even if you have hypertension, um, it's more dramatic in the alumni, the effect of activity. And across body mass index, the normal weight, overweight, and obese, essentially, categories, we see that same effect. And so these are one way to establish this independence. So in the presence or absence of other risk factors, we see an effect of physical activity on mortality. And we did this um, in the Canada Fitness Survey follow-up. This was a study of about 5,000, 5,500 Canadian women followed for mortality. And when you include both waist circumference and physical activity in the same model, they produce independent effects. So for any given level of waist circumference, physical activity showed this negative association with mortality. So adjusting for waist circumference, essentially. And on the other hand, once you adjust for physical activity, waist circumference also shows this positive association with mortality. And I'm just pulling up a paper here that's in press, or I think it's on uh, online publication at American Journal of Clinical Nutrition um, from Ulf Eklund. 
where they're looking at a similar issue. So across categories of normal weight, overweight, and obesity, we still see associated with activity a reduction in mortality risk across all three categories of BMI or across low and high waist circumference. You see we're uncovering this dose response association independent of markers of adiposity. So this is, these are examples of ways we can begin to tease out the independent effects of physical activity on mortality. So, you know, something of great interest uh, to our research group is, you know, how robust is our associations among physical activity and other risk factors or outcomes uh, across the world? You know, in low, middle, and in high income countries, for example, does physical activity incur the same level of risk or is there a similar association with other risk factors? So these are, this is the result of a 12 country study. You see all the countries here. We have high income countries, we have uh, low income and middle income countries represented. These are 6,000 uh, 10 year old children, essentially. And this is the odds of obesity based on uh, one standard deviation of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it's a very robust association. That's about a, a 0.45 uh, odds ratio. So a significantly lower odds of being obese if the kids are physically active. But the interesting thing to me is that this association is in every country. It's significant in every culture, in every contextual situation. So it's not just a phenomenon of North America or South America, it's worldwide. So that just shows again this kind of issue of the robustness of the association between physical activity and one of its correlates, which is obesity. So, you know, we hear a lot of things at the meeting around both physical activity and fitness. I'm going to talk a little bit about fitness now. We, we understand that fitness and physical activity are not essentially the same thing. Physical activity is a behavior where fitness is a trait. Um, and we know there's a certain innate level of fitness that is associated with different outcomes. But the only way really, and Steve Blair says this all the time, the only way to increase your fitness is really to increase physical activity. So there's a high correlation between the two. And you know, we have several textbooks, definitions of fitness. This is one you may not have seen. It's, it could be a verb or a noun. It's the ability to wear a snug garment. You may not have seen this in Iman's textbook, but um, just so you understand, I'll use it in a sentence. And you didn't think I could fit in this bathing suit after three kids. <laughs> That's one definition of fitness. Of course, this is from the classic text of Jeff Foxworthy's Redneck Dictionary. So we have to keep it real. So thinking about fitness, you know, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Steve Blair on the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study, and we were looking at the independent effects of physical fitness on mortality, and in particular where we were interested in metabolic syndrome. So what we did, these are in men, um, almost 20,000 men with 10 years of follow-up, where we divided them in into those that had metabolic syndrome or those that were healthy, meaning they didn't have metabolic syndrome. And in both groups of men, those who were physically fit had a significantly lower mortality rate from, in this case, cardiovascular disease, but it was the same for all-cause mortality. And the interesting thing here is that even if you have metabolic syndrome, if you're physically fit, your risk is lower than an unfit man who's ostensibly healthy with only one or zero risk factors. So this shows that you know, the effects of fitness can almost obliterate the effects of the metabolic syndrome, and it's a very powerful risk factor. Now another study that will lead me into the next section around um, using the independent physical activity variable in clinical medicine is this one. It's a similar concept. This was done by uh, one of my uh, doctoral students, Chris Ardern, where we used the ACLS men and we classified them according to the uh, adult treatment panel guidelines for uh, heart disease risk. Those men that were meeting their LDL goal, those men that were not, that you would refer to TLC, which is therapeutic lifestyle change, and those that would qualify for drug treatment. In other words, their LDL was much, much higher than, uh, the, than it was supposed to be for their level of risk. 
And you see, of course, going across these categories in both fit and unfit men, there's an increased risk of CVD. But the real interesting thing in both or all three groups, those men who are unfit at a much higher mortality risk. Even in men who are at their LDL goal, I think that's astonishing. These are men that come in, their LDL are, is fine. You wouldn't even recommend therapeutic lifestyle changes. They're doing fine. But then look at the effects of being unfit. So it really has a powerful effect at all level of CVD risk. Now, most people have heard of the Framingham scores. You know, there's a variety of them out there to estimate the risk of future heart disease or future CVD or risk of stroke. So just to highlight here, this is one example where they use categories, and of course, things like age, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, whether or not you're a smoker, you added all that up, and then you can kind of compute your risk of a, having a future heart attack. And it's used you know, around the world. Another one that's becoming popular is the American Heart Association risk algorithm. It follows a similar thing. There's more questions. On this. this is on the internet. Anyone can log on and do this. There's 17 questions. And again, it's asking you about your age, your gender, your blood pressure, whether or not you have diabetes. It asks you your height and weight for BMI, your waist circumference, blood pressure, all that stuff. But neither one of these has physical activity on it. Neither one of these has physical fitness. So I logged on and I completed this for an anonymous 46-year-old man from Baton Rouge, uh, totally anonymous, and um, just to see what would happen. And so at the end, you get this action plan that you can print. So for this anonymous 46-year-old man, he, he needs to lose weight, reduce his blood pressure, and manage his cholesterol. Sounds kind of familiar to me, but um, they didn't check the box saying that I had to increase physical activity. So here we have an algorithm that's telling you you need to lose weight, you need to improve your blood pressure and lipids, but it's not telling you, it's not directing you to any kind of physical activity. If I had wanted, I could have clicked that and I went to a page which provided a little bit of information about physical activity, but not a whole lot. And so it's amazing to me that this is not mandatory for every level of risk. They should be directing us there. So why is this? You know, again, data from the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study, we have low fitness as a risk factor for CVD mortality among all these other risk factors which are in the algorithm. And if you look at fitness, it's higher than any of these with the exception of an abnormal ECG or a chronic illness. Those are very high risk. But all these other risk factors are of equal or lesser importance, yet fitness or physical activity does not appear in the algorithm. Well, why is that? Um, and again, it comes back to that question I raised at the beginning, and that we need to do a better job as a profession at talking about the independent effects of physical activity. So if it is independent and it is of equal importance in terms of relative risk, why isn't it in these risk algorithms? Well, we tackled that problem uh, with the help of a postdoc of mine at the time, Ian Jansen, and we called it the Cooper Clinic Mortality Risk Index for Men. You've probably never heard of it. Um, but we did a similar study to Framingham. We used the same methodology, and, but we had fitness in the model. And so it's a similar type of deal. Age is definitely a powerful risk factor for mortality, of course, you know, diabetes, smoking. But fitness came out as a, also a predictor. So this, this mortality risk indicator includes fitness in it as a prognostic indicator for mortality. And we see that increasing risk factor points leads to a substantially increased risk for premature mortality. So very similar to Framingham. But it's only been cited 24 times in the last 10 years. I don't, it's probably just me citing it or Steve, I don't know. I think Steve has papers that were rejected that have been cited more times than this. So it's not out there and I don't see a lot of this, I don't see a lot of this work going on. But I think this is where we need to move in getting physical activity into these risk algorithms. We need more of this type of work. So. The, kind of the last section I wanted to talk about was sedentary behavior. And again, I, I mentioned that you know, sedentary behavior is ubiquitous among the animal kingdom. 
even among fish. They spend a lot of time sitting, apparently. Um, and it's a risk factor. So, you know, we published this um, account of daily sitting and mortality risk among Canadians, and we had a very nice dose response in terms of survival, where those people that sit almost none of the time, you know, 90 to 95% of them were alive at the end of the 12 years, where those that sit almost all the time, you know, less than 80% were alive. And so we have a nice dose response in cumulative survival associated with daily sitting. And we just had a, a recent meta-analysis was published where they, the authors, you know, they pulled the results across several now. There's been, since that study in 2009, there's been almost a dozen papers published in the last six years on um, sedentary behavior and all-cause mortality, and they show this increased risk of mortality associated with sedentary behavior. And it's been amazing that, to, it's been amazing to me um, as someone who works in physical activity epidemiology to see that it took 60 years of epidemiology and intervention research in physical activity to come up with physical activity guidelines for Americans, for example. But the media has jumped all over this sitting. You know, you can't pick up a newspaper or go to MSN. They're not talking about sitting almost every day. And so it's deadly, it's killing us, it's the new smoking. And this is based on about a dozen epidemiological studies. And so there's a call for guidelines for sedentary behavior and all of this sort of thing. But we still need a lot more intervention research, I think, before we jump, uh, jump onto that ship. So the question is then with sedentary behavior, continuing the theme of independence, is it independent of physical activity? Or is physical activity independent of sedentary behavior? That's kind of a big research question right now. And in our study, one of the ways to do that, we divided the, the sample into those who were meeting physical activity guidelines and those who were not. And what we found was a significant dose response association with mortality in both groups. So whether or not you were active or inactive, there's an increased risk with a greater amount of sitting. However, the risk was less in the active. So you see all of the bars are lower than in the inactive group in terms of all-cause death rates. Overall, the active people had lower death rates. And the relative risk associated with sitting was lower. It was a 40% increased risk versus an 86% increased risk. So some people have looked at this and said, well, you know, is it really independent because you have a greater risk profile if you're inactive? It's combining the effects of sedentary behavior and the inactivity. This is another way to look at the same data, but with one reference group. So increasing sitting, increasing mortality, and that, but you see the difference between the active and the inactive groups. Inactive groups tend to have a higher relative risk of mortality associated with sitting. So the question is, is it truly independent? And that meta-analysis I mentioned tried to answer that question. They pulled the results across studies and they came up with a, a relative risk of 1.46 among the inactive or low physical activity group. And in the high activity group, it was 1.16. So it seems that most of the studies being published are showing a greater benefit of the, the lower sitting among people who are inactive. So is it, is it independent of physical activity is the question. I think that's where we need to go next. And so, if you're not sitting, what are you doing? That's a big question. You know, we know about the effects of moderate to vigorous activity, but what do we do about standing? You notice at this meeting in particular and other activity meetings, people tend to stand up in some of the lectures, they'll stand in the back thinking this is healthier than sitting. Well, is it really? Is standing healthier than sitting? Well, I tried to answer that question using the Canada Fitness Survey data, and we found out that indeed it is. It's almost the reverse. These are people that stand almost all of the time, and these are people that stand almost none of the time. And we have, again, a dose response association. This time, greater amount of time spent standing, the lower the risk of mortality. So the question is, is it simply the inverse of sitting? If you're sitting, are you not standing? Well, the correlation is moderate between sitting and standing. Uh, you know, here's the five categories of sitting. 
five categories of standing, and this is the percent of the sample, and you know you have a moderate correlation there, negative 0.5. So it is true there's an association. However, it's not the inverse. Because when you're not sitting, there's a lot of things you can be doing. You could be standing, you could be walking, you could be running. So it's not simply the inverse. So we, we were trying to figure that out now. And looking across the spectrum of um, movement, I guess you'd say, I pulled the data here looking at the effects of sitting, which I've just uh, described to you, going in this direction, the effects of standing, and the effects of physical activity, all within the same cohort of men and women. And so it does see, seem to me there's something special about sitting. You know, their the risk is going up, and as soon as you stand up, now your risk profile turns around. And if I put light activity in here as well, which other cohorts have shown an effect of light activity on mortality, it would be in the same direction. So it seems that as soon as you stand up and begin to move, your risk profile changes. The association with risk turns to an inverse one. So you know, where does that leave us with physical activity? This is the graph I showed you earlier of physical activity and mortality from the, the recent uh, study in JAMA Internal Medicine. Now if you were to now overlay that with the effects of physical fitness from a meta-analysis done in JAMA in 2009, you see a similar kind of relative risk reduction associated with higher levels of physical fitness. Now if you overlay the sitting data, we see almost a similar association. Again, this is another piece of the puzzle when we're trying to untangle these effects, the independent effects you know, of sitting, physical activity, and fitness. So what are we going to do about this problem? Um, I think the, the explosion of research around sedentary behavior has really opened the door to better understand the independent effects of physical activity. You know, it, it certainly spurred a lot of research in sedentary behavior, but now it's really asking the question of, it, of the independence of these behaviors. So it's done a lot of things in terms of uh, turning on the field. So this is amazing. These guys are these guys are working against us. I found this study in Nature. We're here as a profession trying to increase physical activity, increase people's energy expenditure. These yahoos have figured out a way to decrease it. <laughs> They've developed an exoskeleton that you know, you'd wear on the lower limb, and it actually reduces the energy cost associated with walking by 7.2%. So pretty soon we'll be able to buy these things and further decrease our energy expenditure associated with physical activity. So they're working in the opposite direction. So I thought that was very interesting. So in terms of research directions, you know, in my opinion, we, we had a lot going on back in the days of um, the studies of, of PATH and establishing the independence of physical activity and the cause-effect relationships. But now I think we need to renew that effort within the clinical context. You know, the evidence is there. We now need to now show that by adding physical activity to these risk algorithms, we can further define risk. We can improve our, uh, our risk prediction. The, the second area, uh, like I just mentioned, we need to really understand is sedentary behavior independent of physical activity? Big question mark. You know, I, two years ago, if I talked about this, I would say it is independent because all these cohort studies, they adjust for physical activity and they show an independent effect of sitting. However, we're starting to get mixed signals about that with some of the recent studies. The other question, and this is critical to developing guidelines, what is the dose-response association between sedentary behavior and health? You know, we, we don't have that yet. So the best we can do is tell people they need to sit less, they need to watch less television. We can't tell them definitively, you know, it's five hours a day or six hours a day. You know, like I said, we had 60 years of physical activity research. We have six years of sedentary behavior epidemiology. So I think we need a lot more work in this area. And it's very exciting for those people coming into the field. The other question, what do we replace that sedentary behavior with? Is it sufficient to stand up? Or do we need to get people to move around? 
or what are the health hazards associated with standing so much? We know from nurses already, you know, who are on their feet all day, they have problems with um, lower limb um, uh, blood circulation and all these sorts of things, with problems with their back. So we, we need to be able to prescribe something if we're going to tell them not to sit. What is it? We need the interventions to tell us. Now we have a lot of very unique or new analytical strategies like substitution analysis, compositional analysis to try to get at this, but we really need the intervention research. We need to reduce sitting in humans and look at the physiological effects. And the studies are going on right now. Finally, you know, do we need to refine the public health message with all of this information now? We, we understand fitness is a very powerful predictor of mortality, yet the minimal physical activity guidelines are unlikely to affect your fitness level. You know, 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week of just moderate. If you do the minimum, you're unlikely to increase your fitness very much. Also, the sedentary behavior. Is standing up going to wipe out the effects of the physical activity? We don't know. And so I think these are key questions that still need to be answered. So with that, um, I'd like to show this slide. I, I put the word uh, senior in quotes, because most of these individuals could um, qualify for AHARP, or the, uh, what is it, the American Association of Retired People, uh, except for I men, of course. That's why I put the, the quotes there. She definitely does not qualify. But these individuals have um, been phenomenal at guiding me in my career to date, and I really want to uh, thank them for their help. With that, I also thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. That was very interesting. And thank you for stopping on time. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. Any questions from the audience? OK, if not, then I'll take the opportunity to ask you two questions. The first was easy, and the second is maybe that's not really an answer. The first question is the Canadian fitness study that you showed with the three charts of uh, sitting, standing, and physical activity. They were all adjusted for the other domains. Yes, yes. So you still saw those relationships. Independent. Thank you. Yes. And my second question is one, so you brought up a really interesting issue when you showed all those risk prediction algorithms like the Framingham AHA where physical activity is in there. You have data from the uh, Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. I think it would be interesting to look at predictions. So use current algorithms, for example, like Framingham. If you use those algorithms, you can, you can uh, do predictions in terms of mortality or cardiovascular risk, right? The standard ones that don't have physical activity. I was thinking it might be very interesting to compare the risk, the predictive ability of these standard instruments versus one where it might be very useful clinically because I think most people know their blood pressure, most people know whether they smoke or not, they know their age, they probably know whether they have diabetes or not, but they might not know their cholesterol. What if you had the same predictive algorithms, but you made it very simple, you just did age, smoking, and maybe none of the other covariates, but put in, okay, I'm going to say fitness, which not everybody knows, but maybe physical activity. Does that predict it as well? Yeah. No, that's a very that good question, and I think, you know, that, that's where we need to go. You take a current risk algorithm, you add physical activity in, and look at the change in the C statistic or whatever to see does it add the predictive ability. And, you know, the one that we did for the Cooper Clinic, I don't know if you noticed that, but there was no lipids in there. There was no, uh, uh, no cholesterol in there. And I think that's why it, people can't believe that fitness is better than cholesterol in the model. Right, but that analysis looked at the increased relative risk with different numbers of risk factors yeah. versus actually looking at C statistic or the predictive ability. You know, like if you're a clinician, if I gave you this Framingham algorithm, you have a 5% risk of developing heart disease over the next 10 years. But what if I didn't use the Framingham? If I just did age, whatever, and physical active, does it give you the prediction to the same? I think that would be really interesting. That let's, would be very let's talk. Yeah. Ken. 
Hi, uh, I'm Ken Powell from Atlanta, and Peter, that was really a very fine talk. Thanks uh, Thank you. for giving it to all of us. I just have a, a quick question, and, and I think my question is most of the time when you said physical activity, did you mean moderate to vigorous physical activity? So yeah, that's a, yeah, moderate to vigorous, and I should qualify leisure time physical activity as well. Yes, we didn't, um, most of the models, you know, we don't include occupational level of physical activity, except in a couple of instances. It's moderate to vigorous leisure time. Yeah. And one last question, please. Anyone, anyone else? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I was just going to compliment you, Peter. <laughs> Thanks. It was uh, a, a, a great talk, uh, particularly since most of the slides will be in a talk that I'm giving this afternoon as well. Uh, uh, take that as a compliment. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I'm Bill Cole. I, I actually used to be in Atlanta, uh, Ken. Um, one of the things that really bothers me and I hadn't seen before is when you went and did your, your online profile at the AHA. Uh, and you clicked all through things, and you might or might not have cholesterol or, or blood pressure problems. What do we need to do to get a group like the American Heart Association or anyone else to take this seriously? Even if you didn't have high blood pressure or high uh, cholesterol problem or uh, were uh, needed to lose some weight, that physical activity box should be checked. And, and, and I, I, it, it, it confounds me to no end. And you want to see blood pressure go up, talk to Steve Blair about this yeah. one day. But tell, do you have some thoughts on, on how institutionally that can, uh, can change? Not just for AHA, but yeah. it's still the elephant in the room. No one talks about this, but we all know about it because it's our field. But how do we get it out of the room and into, into the wild? That's an extremely good question. I mean, the American Heart Association has a, a physical activity committee. They have the Lifestyle Council. They're, they're, they should be aware of this. Um, we go to the meetings, we present our work. But I think what I'm in is talking about is what they need. They want to see evidence. They want to see what is the change in the C statistic when you add physical activity? What does it really add? But on the other hand, if you look at those 17 questions, a lot of those to me are redundant. You know, you're asking about, well, Bob Ross is in here, I don't think, but you're asking about BMI, and then you're also asking about waist circumference and the different cholesterol fractions. So I think a lot of that information could be simplified um, and put something in about physical activity. It would probably trump it. Um, but I think, you know, IMIN's got it right. We need to develop the models and show them because the American Heart Association, a lot of the fellows are, you know, the Framingham group, and, you know, they've been around for a long time making these decisions. So. We need to infiltrate them. Yeah. All right, we're going to end on time, and I'm going to end by thanking Dr. Ketsmazi and giving him a little token from the American College of Sports Medicine. Thank you very much, right. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.